The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome on the hottest day of the year. And on hot days, I have taken liberty to not put on my winter black robe and things. So I hope, as I said last week, I hope you can still find God in the midst of a sport coat. Um, I know I can. So uh, it's good to see everybody, and thank you for being here today on this uh, summer Sunday. It's good to see everyone. I'm Bert Brooks, the pastor and preacher today. The Reverend Kathleen Mons is assisting with worship. Kathy Toole is our minister of music, and we've got Danielle who uh, is uh, providing our special music today. So we're so excited to be part of this. Um, if you're visiting with us, just make yourself at home. Uh, enjoy this time. I'd love to meet you as you're coming out the door just to say hello and, and just to touch base with you. So if you will uh, find me after service, I won't hold you up long. There is an attendance register on your row if you can find it and send it down. I appreciate that. Uh, we would have a record of your being with us. We don't have any announcement outside of what you can read here on the bulletin, so at your convenience, I would ask you to take a look at that. If you did not get the flyer for these chocolate supplies, they're in the hallway. Just pick one up on your way out, and uh, you can follow the directions on this. We've had a good morning uh, so far for a hot day. Good worship early this morning in Sunday school, and a good group here today. Our topic today, or our message today, is that familiar scripture, Mary and Martha. And if you've ever heard it once, you probably already know which way it goes. And so what I'm going to do for you today is I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to take a new look at that scripture, and I think we will add all of these things together and make it an even bolder scripture than we may remember. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for our worship.
For those who are able, I would invite you to please stand for our call to worship. Seek refuge in God. Like green olive trees in the house of God, we will dwell in the steadfast love of God forever. Seek refuge in God. We put our trust in God because of God's mighty deeds. Seek refuge in God. In the presence of the faithful, we proclaim God's holy name. Don't sit down yet. There are children who I want to invite to come up and join me for children's time, if you would let them get out. And then while they are coming, there's a neighbor that really wants to speak to you and say good morning. Let us welcome our neighbors this morning. Okay. Thanks everyone for welcoming one another. And it's so good to see you guys this morning. Let's go over our special greeting. I'm going to say Jesus loves me and you're going to say every day and then I'm going to flip it. Jesus loves me every day and every day 
Jesus loves me. Hey, I want to get your advice on something. Let's say we're having someone come over to our house, friend or family or whoever it might be. What are some of the things we need to know if somebody's coming over? You have any idea? Manners, absolutely. That, yeah, we go over that at our house. Um, what else do some of the things that we might want to consider if someone's coming over? Allergies, absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Especially when they come to our house and the cat is there. Yeah, so we have to put the cat up. Anything else you can think of that we want to consider? Somebody comes over? How about something to eat? Maybe, some things to do, all kinds of preparations perhaps being made. Well, and those are all good things. In the scripture, the Bible reading I'm going to do today, there are two sisters named Mary and Martha. Do you have any Marys up here or Marthas? Do you know anyone named Mary or Martha? All right, that's a name that goes way back, doesn't it? Well, in our Bible lesson today, Jesus comes to their house. And, of course, they are sisters, and they do what sisters do. And um, do any of you have a sister? Do you ever, ever kind of have a disagreement with your sister? Have you ever had a disagreement? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they didn't really see eye to eye as the story goes. But it's a fun story. And so I want you, when that time comes, listen carefully to the two sisters Mary and Martha, who have Jesus over at their house. It's a good story. Let's have a prayer before you go. Could you bow your heads and repeat after me? Dear Lord, come to our house anytime. We'd love to have you. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Bert, before the children leave, I want to remind them to get their parents. Today is National Ice Cream Day. <laughs> National Ice, Ice Cream, Cream Day. Day. President Ronald Reagan declared this month National Ice Cream Month and the third Sunday National Ice Cream Day. So make wow. sure your parents take you for ice cream. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> And let me just say, if there's any issue, Jerry Edwards is who you talk to. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Well, Jerry, I, every day at my house is National Ice Cream Day, so that's good to know. Do you know any places in town that are giving anything away? There are some, but I haven't checked it out. Any? Can I throw this out to the congregation? Where? Kroger has the, their brand for 99 cents a gallon. I have to have it or something. So. <laughs> this time, we're so pleased. I want to invite Chelsea up and whoever you have that is going to stand with you. Chelsea. Yeah, whoever. Look, you got a lot of people. They're just coming on up. Some old friends, some new friends. Yeah, let's just stand down. And Kathy. Matt, okay. Well, Chelsea, it is so wonderful for you to choose us to be your church home. You're kind of a return. You, you grew up here. You, you knew some folks, and um, you've come back. And uh, you do have a connection that many uh, people know, Brian and Vicki, uh, parents, Rogers. And so Chelsea uh, is here. Now, Chelsea, I like to have fun before you join. I just want to make sure you're making a good decision. Look at these folks that are standing with you. The, <laughs> Do you really want them as friends? I guess that's the question. <laughs> of course. And look at this group, because this is your church family out here at Bonaire United Methodist Church. And so if you, if you are so willing to have us, we feel honored. And so, Chelsea, I want to ask you just a basic um, questions. You will be received by profession of faith. 
And do you affirm your hope and commitment in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and commit to follow Christ as his faithful disciple? If so, I do. I do. And as a member of Bonaire United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its mission and ministries through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, I will. Friends, I commend Chelsea to your love and care. As a member of Bonaire United Methodist Church, I ask that you do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. Let us as a congregation join together in a response found on the screen or in your bulletin. We rejoice to recognize you as a member of Christ Holy Church and bid you welcome to Bon Air United Methodist Church. As members of the body of Christ with you, we renew our covenant to faithfully participate with you in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Chelsea, on behalf of Bonaire United Methodist Church, we are so pleased to welcome you into this membership. And we have a couple of things that are reminders. We have a certificate that says, you're official. Take this to any store and you get free ice cream all day long. <laughs> and the official Bible of Bonaire, the Wesley Study Bible, and we hope that uh, it will be a blessing to you. Let us welcome our newest member. <laughs> Chelsea, other than that, we get your picture taken at the close of service. And you're officially, you're officially official. So anyway, I turn you over to friends and the congregation. Well, as we're getting ready uh, for morning prayer, at that time, I'll invite Pastor Kathleen to lead us in prayer. But what about some joys and good news as we prepare? Charles, I see you way back in the back. What's up? Uh-huh. Well, congratulations. congratulations. And you... Uh, you had a hot day to be, to be out on the course yesterday. But uh, again, if you don't know, Charles had a fall earlier. What was it, last winter? And had to have surgery. You were a runner, and now you're getting back at it. So you're, you're just an example of a blessing uh, that God has done good work with. So good, Charles. What else? Val? Well, Well, go ahead and say it out loud, Valerie. Who's got a birthday in your family? Elvin cordell has got a birthday today. Congratulations and happy birthday. Yeah, good. Any other news? Anything else for us this morning? Um, okay. Well, do I see anything? Nope. Pastor Kathleen, I invite you for morning prayer. I invite you to join your hearts with mine. Let us pray. Almighty and sovereign God, as your children, we gather again in this wonderful place, a place that is cool because of something called air conditioning that we all appreciate on an extremely hot and humid day. And yet we are reminded that for as blessed as we are, there are many who do not have that privilege or accessibility to the coolness in the midst of the heat. We ask you, O oh Lord, to watch over all of our brothers and sisters that are struggling, and not just with a place for shelter, but they're struggling with issues in their lives. 
whether it's recovery from illness, whether it's facing surgery or treatments, or dealing with unexpected changes in a health status. We lift them to you, Lord, because they are our brothers and sisters. We come remembering that you have blessed us in ways that we cannot always comprehend or understand in the midst of living the blessings. But so many millennia ago, you blessed Abraham to be a blessing to others and help us to live out those blessings in our daily lives. Whether we are greeting somebody, whether we are assisting someone, let those individuals be aware that you are answering prayers. We come today a, a people who live in a life that is filled with contrast. In our nation, we celebrate accomplishments, especially this past week, accomplishments of sending and bringing our brothers back from the moon. We thank you for the teamwork of men and women who work together to make that accomplishment. So in the midst of accomplishments, we also remember our failures our failures to see you in the face of each other, to see you in the midst of the people who are different. Open our eyes, Lord, open our hearts, and open our willingness to follow the nudging of your Holy Spirit, even in our daily lives. We do, O oh Lord, lift to you every leader around this, your world, men and women in positions of authority, some elected, some appointed, and some who have taken those positions. We ask you, O oh Lord, to nudge and place in their hearts your vision of what it is for us to be your people. This prayer, O oh Lord, and all prayers, spoken and unspoken from our hearts. We lift to you in the name of Jesus who taught us to come before your throne of grace, boldly praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I stand before you today by the grace of God and your love and prayers and dedicated support to read and share with you today's scriptures. In Psalm 52, our first reading begins as a prophetic injunction against a faithless, deceitful, self-sufficient warrior, then pivots to a profound statement of trust in God's faithfulness. In the psalm, there's a musical direction, Selah, that tells us to express exclamation. And so listen now for the word of God to us. Why do you boast, O mighty one, of mischief done against the godly? All day long you are plotting destruction. Your tongue is like a sharp razor, your worker, worker of treachery. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking the truth, Selah. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living, Selah. The righteous will see and fear, and will laugh at the evildoer, saying, See the one who would not take refuge in God? 
but trusted in abundant riches and sought refuge in wealth. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because of what you have done in the presence of the faithful. I will proclaim your name, for it is good. Here ends the first lesson. And for the second lesson, we read in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 1, and it tells of the supremacy of Christ. Listen again for the words of God this day. He, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has now been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And Paul, in writing, said, I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is the word of God for all God's people. Thanks be to God.
Please stand as you're able as we receive our gospel message from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Word of God for us, God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to you God. God. You may be seated. How many of you in your professional or academic or just for your own understanding, have taken a Myers-Briggs personality test. Oh, just about everybody. How many have taken it twice? Does anybody take How about 10 times? Give me a 10. I suspect that in whatever work, at least in the last 30 years, if it was a certain type of, of work, you took this test, or perhaps your office went on a retreat somewhere and everybody had to take this test, and everybody had to be analyzed. I suppose I've taken it uh, three or four times, and if you don't know what it is, I'm going to tell you right now, and then we can move on to some more important things. The Myers-Briggs test has four categories. And the first is whether you're an extrovert or introvert. So if you're an extrovert, you get an E, and if you're an introvert, you get an I. Okay? You with me? You got a letter in your head so far? Okay. The next is the way you take in information. Are you sensing or do you use intuition? Sensing or intuition? Sensing S. 
intuition N. Got a letter? This is an S or N. The next one is how you make decisions. Thinking or feeling. If you're a thinking person, it's a T, or feeling person, it's an F. Okay? You got the third letter. And the last but not least, how you deal with the world. Judging or perceiving. Judging, J, or perceiving, P. Test over. Everybody at Bonaire has now taken the Myers-Briggs personality test. We can go ahead and be done with this thing. I happen to be an ISTJ. Um, then we need another two days to unpack these letters um, once you determine them. But it helps. It's fun. When I was doing my studies over the years on Mary and Martha, I read all kinds of things. Like, what kind of personalities are these two sisters? In other words, you might be a Martha if you're organized, a hard worker, and a perfectionist. You might be a Mary if you're curious, free-spirited, and social. Well, so many teachers and preachers have pretty much said this is about two different personalities and there you go. And they conclude the sermon with, you need to be a Mary and a Martha at different times, or, this is the one I like the best, you need the hands of Martha and the heart of Mary. And we could go home. I mean, you, you can stretch that out for 20 or 30 minutes and still come around to the same thing. Is that what this is about? I, it could be, sure, it could be. It's good. I think this scripture really has very little downside to it because both of these women are faithful disciples of Jesus. We start with what we know. They're faithful disciples of Jesus. They are friends of Jesus. They are with Jesus on numerous occasions. He is in their home. They had a brother Lazarus who Jesus raised from the dead. These are not strangers. According to this scripture that Jesus is on a journey. We know he's, where he's going. He's going to Jerusalem. This is a scripture that more or less is toward the end of Jesus' lifetime ministry. And they stop at the home of Mary and Martha. Well, Martha welcomed Jesus at the door. That's a good thing, isn't it? If you ever get these confused, I always think about Martha Stewart. And then I know who Mary is after that. So uh, it works pretty well just to have that little memory jogger there. Now, it's interesting how this thing goes. I tried my best to somehow shoehorn that uh, sister's song in that old holiday classic, Holiday Inn, Sisters, Sisters, you know that one? If you've ever watched that once, it's a, it's a pretty good song, but it didn't quite have the lyrics that I needed to make it work here. Uh, something about uh, the man who gets between me and my sister or the sister who gets between me and my man. And I worked on this. I probably gave this 20 minutes of thought trying to figure out how I could squeeze that thing in there. Realized at the end it didn't work. So uh, I'm just telling you that's what I did. So um, where we are with this is it's kind of an interesting turn of events here. Jesus is in the home, and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus while Martha is doing whatever the preparations. Well, I don't think this is the first time this has happened. I'm led to believe that this is an ongoing rub between these two sisters. That Martha, you know how, how people in the house are, whether it's your significant other, or your sister, or your brother, someone is hyper-responsible, aren't they not? Nothing's going to get done around here if I don't do it. Do you know people like that? They will miss the games. They will miss the guest. They will miss everything that is happening at the moment because they have equally important tasks. Mary is obviously irresponsible, if you get right down to it. I mean, you know. She's not taking care of business. 
There's a new term that I became familiar with, and I wish I'd have had it a few decades ago because I have felt this emotion so many times in my life, and I did not have a word, and I didn't pick up the right word until I went to uh, with uh, one, of the, one of my sons to a college orientation, and they gave me the word. It was like a flash of, of, of brilliance. It was called hangry. Uh, hangry. Uh, is a word that if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's when you're so hungry and the presenter or the professor or the preacher won't stop, you begin to get angry and hungry. And that's where hangry comes in. The church coined that word 2,000 years ago. We just didn't, didn't know that because I have been in front of you long enough and I've been in this long enough to know that about quarter to 12 hunger starts. I can see it. You start cutting your eyes at me. You start looking at each other. You start pulling the, 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 uh, the time out. You start, yeah, you start going time, but you don't say it. Um, people start drifting out the back door during the offering. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, you see it because they're hungry. The faithful who are too embarrassed to do that, if this thing goes on to about 1220, that emotion is hangry right there. And you don't, you're not, you're not let, you don't forget it by people you shake hands with. So I suspect that at some point they need to take a break. Jesus and Mary and Martha, they just need to take a break, have some refreshments or whatever. Now, I don't know how this story ended. I'm just rambling. I'm just going gonna, gonna to hit it straight in just a minute. I'm just rambling. It seems that when I study Scripture, there's enough unknown in this that I can project my personality, negative or positive, into this and come up with the ultimate solution. So, I thought, how many other endings can I put to this story after Jesus says... Mary has chosen the better part and will not be taken, taken from her. Then what does Martha say? The, the script is over. It's a period. Here's what I think Martha will say. Okay, I, that's, a, that's a great idea. I would like to learn too, so I think if it's all right with everybody, we will order pizza out. Okay? We will order pizza out. When Jesus finishes teaching, we'll have this pizza ready. Do you think it could possibly have ended like that? Um, I don't know. It could be. Or Mary could have suggested, well, perhaps we go out to eat. And Martha might have said, great, I can then go and visit with you. Now, the worst side of that, the flip side, is it causes another tiff between the two sisters that have, has already seemed to uh, create some tension. Well, there's more to this story than these two sisters. They are well loved by Jesus. We don't have to go through that. They are with Jesus at the very end. We don't have to go through that. But what about Jesus? Is this story about Jesus at all? Or does he get lost somewhere while we're trying to analyze the actions of these two? I would say yes. If you're not careful, you, will, you don't even need Jesus in this story. Well, I want to give you three observations that I see very clear that has to do with Jesus. And just so that you will remember them, I'm going to give you something easy to remember them by. I'm going to call these three one two, and three. And you will be able to remember this. Number one, I think this is a, is a story about time. The 1960s group who are still around Chicago had a hit song. It says, does anybody really know what time it is? And then, of course, it goes, does anybody really care and the rest of the song. But you don't have to be in too many Sunday school classes or sit through too many sermons to know that when we think about God, we think about two 
ways to look at time. There's Kairos time. That's God's time. Those of you who are, who are retired clergy, you have preached on this many times, Kairos time. It, is, it, is, it comes upon you and you're not expecting it per se. There are words like in the fullness of time, at just the right time. When time stood still for every season under heaven, that's Kairos time. You can't look at a calendar. You can't look at a watch. You can't look at the timer on the microwave. You can't look at your phone. You can't look at the sun in the sky. That's Kronos time. That is just the ticking of the day. Tick, 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 tick. What you do with Kronos time is really what you do with your day. But what you do with Kairos time begins with even knowing that it's happening. When Jesus enters our lives for ever such a short period of a bold, bold moment, that's Kairos time. And you really don't need to do anything in Kairos time. The transfiguration was Kairos time. When Jesus healed, it was Kairos time. When Jesus told parables about the kingdom, the listener was in Kairos time. And so we have two definitions of time happening under one roof. We've got one who sees that this is a Kairos moment and one who, who is on Kronos time. It's not that they're mutually exclusive. They were intersecting and sometimes Kronos and Kairos comes together at just the same time. And so I think Jesus is talking about not that Mary is better or worse or smarter or not smarter or this or that. Jesus is declaring Kairos time. Jesus is in the house. The second thing I want to glean about this, it's not particular to Mary and Martha, is that worry and distraction is an ongoing human challenge, and it has been since the beginning of time. I think Jesus was offering Mary pastoral care. Oh, I'm sorry, Martha. Martha, you are distracted and worried about many things. How many Marthas go on to that definition? Most go on, I'm here to serve. I'm a servant, a disciple. But very few Marthas would say, my primary characteristic is I'm worried and distracted by many things. I don't think you have to be a Martha or a Mary. To know that the world we live in is just such that there is enough uncertainty about who we are and where we're going and what the future will hold. And that many people are spending their lives worrying rather than the one thing, the thing that we call Jesus Christ. This is actually a recurring theme in Scripture. It's not just exclusive to this one. Two weeks ago, we had a Scripture that said, Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That was not an insult. It was a statement of focus and priority. What is the priority of life? It is Jesus, we believe, and we keep our eyes on the prize. And we don't just simply be tossed by the wind wherever we are. We know that great story that Peter almost got it right. He almost got it right when he asked Jesus, Lord, may I step out of this boat and walk on water? And for a moment, he had his eyes on Jesus. And then the next moment, he turned his head and saw the wind. 
and began to sink. And so Jesus had to take him by hand and put him back in the boat. The scripture time after time after time says that once we set our eyes upon Jesus, the other things will fall into place. Seek first the kingdom of God and then these things will be added unto you. And so Martha was distracted and worried. Jesus said, you don't have to be like that anymore. And he essentially set her free. That's a powerful story, is it not? To be even more who she already was as a disciple. And then the third and last thing we see in this story is that Jesus is with us. We are so, in 2019, we are so far removed sometimes from a real understanding of our God that we forget that our God is one that has come to us in Jesus. Not a God that sits in the outer solar system somewhere, rocking in a cosmic chair, every now and then coughing and causing some kind of commotion, but essentially unattached and not interested. Many people have a God like that. They grew up in a church and they learned that. Somehow from family they learned that God is way up there just waiting to stomp us with God's divine heel. If we don't straighten up, there is nothing in this story that justifies that. As a matter of fact, we see a Jesus who comes into our homes and talks to us and visits with us. The scripture says, Lo, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open this door, I will come in and I will have a meal with you. And so this Jesus that so oftentimes so many people are running away from as fast as they possibly can or wagging their finger at God, perhaps they've got the wrong impression. Perhaps they don't really know the God they're angry with. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own joy we share as we tarry there. You see, that's the God in this story. Friends to Martha and Mary calls them by name, sits at their table, reclines in their whatever family room or whatever the day would bring. And so these to me go far beyond just simply a personality type of are we a Mary or are we a Martha. There's far more in this story to add to this. This is all, this story is all bonus material as far as I'm concerned. If you can grab all of this out of this story, you really have sat at the feet of Jesus. If you can grab all of this out of this story, you really know the two that Jesus loves. As I said, maybe I didn't say, maybe I said earlier, you know, I forget sometimes what I say from the early service to this service, but I said this is one of those, those scriptures, there's, there's no big downside in it. They are still on the team, even after the scripture has concluded. It's not like the rich young man where Jesus mourns the loss of someone who chose something other than him. In current vernacular, something I say at our table quite often, after a long discourse or epistle by some child that has something on their mind and has been distracted or has been tripped up by some concept, will eventually come around to my favorite saying and perhaps yours too, it's all good. Amen.
may be seated. At this time, if our ushers would come forward to receive our morning offering, as we have the opportunity and privilege to return to God a portion of the gifts already given to us by God. I invite you to join with me, please, in our prayer of dedication. God of eternity, we bring our gifts to your altar to this day. We have crammed our lives full of activity and busyness, missing the opportunity we have to be renewed in your presence, bathe in your love, and open our souls to being filled, renewed, and restored by your grace. Help us to bring our whole being to your altar this morning, that we don't miss the precious gift that you have offered to us, a relationship through Jesus Christ. In that name that is above all others, we pray. 
Amen. Was my hope that we all have something to take away from this sacred ground this day. Something that has brought us closer to Christ, closer to one another. And perhaps some attitudes have softened and some new images of who Jesus will be in our life moving forward. And so if any of those things were to take place here, our time is not in vain. Go forth now in peace. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you all today and forevermore. Amen.